Well, I'm going to make it really short and sweet and informal, <laughs> but we are so happy to welcome back Gregory Bastianelli here for another talk on spooky, scary books that I'm afraid to read. <laughs> <laughs> Without further ado, and I want you to have as much time to scare us as you can. Oh, boy. Gregory graduated from the University of New Hampshire. He studied writing, of course. You worked for a small Not newspaper. Not math. <laughs> <laughs> Not me either. Um, a small newspaper for two decades. And the highlights of that were your sh you enjoyed inter uh, interviewing Shocker Rocker. I like that. That's put in. Um, Alice Cooper. And B-movie icon Bruce Campbell. Mm -hmm. So from there, you come up with scary books. <laughs> and one of your favorite authors is Stephen King. Right? Yes, I a fellow Maine, a Maine resident here okay. uh, in this well, illustrious state. Please <laughs> take us away with your spooky stuff too, Greg. Okay. All right. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I was going to sit down, but it looks too comfortable. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm uh, Gregory Bastinelli. I'm a horror writer. Um, and I'm a member of the Horror Writers Association and the New England Horror Writers. And my latest book, my fifth book, just came out last month and it's called Appropriately October. Now you may be wondering, what's a horror writer doing promoting a book called October in November? Well, I like to think that horror is something that can last beyond October. As we all just recently saw a week ago, November can have some pretty horrifying things in it too. <laughs> and uh, um, and uh, so I like to think, uh, you know, we can have Christmas in July, so we can have horror in November, or December, or January. It's, it's universal all year round. Uh, and I know Sharon is very frightened to read horror <laughs> things. Um, I like to think horror is fun to read, and uh, fun to be a little scared. As long as you know that, you know, when you get to the end of the book, you know, it's, it's not real. None of it is real. Um, when I was growing up, the family used to go to uh, York Beach a lot, and we'd go to York's Wild Kingdom and the amusement park there. And my favorite rides were always the Fun House rides. And they had two of them at York's amusement park, and they're called fun houses. They're not called fright houses. You would think they'd be called fright houses because the whole idea of the fun houses are to be frightened. But they call them fun houses. See, they're supposed to be fun. So, and uh, you know, when you go to Disney World, the funnest rides are the ones that are scary, like the Tower of Terror and the Haunted Mansion. And it's a small world after all. Oh, those are all very scary. <laughs> so. Anyway, this book um, was a book I had planned for a long time, and uh, I finally had the idea years and years ago. I wanted to write a book that was uh, full of autumn in New England, uh, all the things uh, in the season that you like, uh, you know, the leaves turning, carving jack-o'-lanterns, and uh, telling spooky stories and putting up decorations and uh, celebrating the Halloween season, trick-or-treating. Who doesn't like trick-or-treating? It's nowadays it's one of the only time you actually go to your neighbor's houses is to go trick-or-treating. And uh, when I was a kid, I loved going trick-or-treating. And then uh, as I got older and I couldn't go trick-or-treating, that's kind of sad. It's almost like when you realize, you know, there's no Santa Claus. It's like, oh, I can't go trick-or-treating anymore. Um, but then, but then when my daughter was uh, born, and then I could go trick-or-treating all over again. And then, then she got to an age where it was like, no, Dad, you can't come with me anymore. So I was like, oh, so then I didn't get to go trick-or-treating anymore. And, and then she had kids, and now I get to go trick-or-treating again. So, so I've been enjoying trick-or-treating for a long time. Now, I set this book uh, in uh, 1970, because I wanted this book to have an old-time nostalgic feel. And I also wanted to sort of recreate the kind of Halloween season that I remember as a kid. So it's set in 1970. It revolves around uh, f four young boys who uh, notice some strange events happening in town uh, that are timed to the mysterious arrival of a man in black who arrives on October 1st in, 
as the sun's coming up and uh, once he arrives, strange things are happening and these four boys seem to be the only ones in town kind of paying attention to the phenomenon that's going on in town. And uh, there are four boys who are obsessed with the show Dark Shadows. And it was, I was obsessed with the show Dark Shadows as a kid. And, uh, and so they're, they're used to watching weird things and strange phenomena happening on the show and now they see it happening in real life in their town. So. Um, I'm going to read just the very opening scene, very short scene, and then I can um, entertain questions. And you can th think of some th things to ask while I'm reading. So it, the book opens with the arrival of this mysterious man who shows up on a, on a train just before the sunrise on October 1st. Now each chapter in this book is a day of the month. So it starts on October 1st and goes all the way to the 31st where it culminates in Halloween night. So, <clears throat> October 1st. The train halted atop the hill above Maplewood. It was unusual for it to stop at this small town in central New Hampshire, but it did early in the morning on the first day of October in 1970 with a shrill blow of its whistle. A fragment of the moon, like a broken piece of communion wafer, hung low in the sky between cotton candy shreds of clouds just above the treetops on the northern horizon. To the east, the sun made its first appearance to start the new day. A lone passenger stepped off the train onto an old rickety wooden platform. He was dressed in black with a cloak around his shoulders. A top hat rested at a crooked angle on his head. An old man with a wrinkled face and eyes sunk deep into their sockets. Lonely eyes. In one gnarled hand, twisted by the years as if Father Time had tried to wring them dry, he held a dark leather valise. He set it down on the platform and surveyed the town. Behind him, the train hissed as it began to pull away with a loud cranking of its steel wheels. Soon it built up speed and a gust of rushing wind blew against the old man, causing the tails of his coat to flap around the backs of his legs. He raised a hand to his hat to keep it in place until the train passed and the wind fell away. To his right lay a stone foundation of what had once been a ticket station back in the days when the train made regular stops in the little town. Grass had now overgrown much of the cement walls, which were chipped and chiseled like neglected teeth. Downhill from the platform lay the village center, its main street running north, parallel to the railroad tracks, till it reached the town green. There the road split east and west, running along the front of the park. To the west, the road ran underneath the railroad trestle and toward a development of poorly kept houses and tenement rows on the other side of the tracks. The road to the east led over a wooded covered bridge, crossing a lazy river along the back side of the town green and disappeared into rolling pastures of farmland. I'm back, the old man thought. Below in the town, he spotted the country store. He pulled the cloak tighter around him to fight off the morning chill. A tear appeared from one eye, maybe because of the cold air, but he doubted that. Something else made that tear fall, something he had left behind when he was last here. He couldn't believe it had been this, this long. Where has the time gone? If only I could wave my magic wand and bring it all back. He reached down with a slight twinge in his spine and grasped the handle of the, his valise, almost afraid he wouldn't be able to straighten back up, and lifted the bag off the platform. The wind picked up a bit and he could sense something in the fall air more than the smell of dying leaves. Dramatic things were going to happen in the, morning, in the coming days, he thought. A little magic was in the air. He could feel it all around. With determined steps, he descended the wooden staircase built into the side of the small hill that led to the village center below. By the time he got to the bottom of the stairs, he felt nearly out of breath. He stopped and gathered in enough air to prime his lungs and then continued to Main Street. Lights were on in the country store. A great porch fronted the business with a cast iron bench resting between two large windows on the front and the front door. A chalkboard hung on the wall between the two windows and written in dusty white chalk with the specials of the day. He ascended the four small steps to the porch and opened the door, a creak emanating from its tired hinges. Assorted smells assaulted him as he stepped through the doorway, cheese, pickles, maple syrup, and the sugary scent of candy. He remembered buying penny candy in here a long time ago. A quick glance around by the object of his quest, a pile of newspapers on a shelf built into the front counter. He glanced down, passing over the Boston papers till he found the local one. He pulled out of his front pocket a small change purse and pried it open, 
sticking two long trembling fingers inside and extracting a couple of coins. He set the money on the counter, smiling faintly at the man by the register but making no attempt to engage in conversation and picked up the newspaper. He tucked it under his arm and headed out to the front porch. There he sat on the bench and with his bag on the floor at his side and the newspaper on his lap. He gazed out at the businesses along Main Street, a pharmacy, flower shop, hardware store, barbershop, bakery, bank, cinema. He smiled. The sadness Mark and his early arrival remained absent for the moment. This would be a nice town to stay in forever. It would be a nice town to live in and a nice town to die in. And that's the beginning. <laughs> Okay, any questions that you'd like to ask? There is no Maplewood in Hampshire. No, no. Maplewood is actually the name of the street I uh, first grew up on. <laughs> yes. Uh, who were your favorite authors? Did you do a lot of reading as a child? I did. Um, I started out, uh, my favorite author starting out was uh, the first author I remember being a fan of was Ray Bradbury. And of course his book, uh, Something Wicked This Way Comes, plays a huge role in influencing this book. You know, that was set in, uh, in uh, autumn uh, in a small town with a mysterious carnival arrives and a lot of strange goings on. So that, was a, that book was one of my biggest influences uh, as a kid. And um, I also uh, when, uh, liked Richard Matheson. Uh, uh, he was another big influence. He wrote I Am Legend, Hell House, uh, The Shrinking Man, which was made into the movie back in the 50s. So those are two big, big influences. And of course, when Stephen King came along, that was, that was a major, major impact. Yes. So along with the authors that you kind of get inspiration from, when you're thinking about these things, and like you mentioned, the, the market, um, do you picture like City Hall Market or something in Dover in your head, or, you yeah. know, is it that kind of thing, or things that you guys, you and your friends did when you were growing Yeah, I, I, um, I, so, so far every one of my books has been set in a fictional town, but I usually take pieces of bits of towns that I've visited or been in or lived in or experienced and kind of I, I like to put them together to make my own town yeah and I actually I actually uh, drew on a, a sheet of paper hand drew a, a whole map of the town of Maplewood and I, I drew all the streets I wrote in the street names I, I wrote in the, the houses where the, the, each the main characters lived and where the train tracks were and you know, the cemetery and 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 all that and I hung it hung on my wall in my a uh, little room that I use as an office and so whenever I was the kids were running driving riding the bikes or somewhere in the street I'd have to look at the map and say okay they're gonna go onto this street okay and take a right out here yeah okay so when yeah. you write, when you write your books you normally do that make a map um, I uh, on a couple of yes on a couple of case, other occasions I have drawn like little not as detailed as this one because I really wanted to I wanted this story to encompass the whole town uh, much like Stephen King did with Salem's Lot, um, and and really involved the whole town. So I, for this one, I really made a detailed map. Others I might just sketch, you know, a simple little diagram of of where things are. Yes. Can you tell us a scary experience that you've had personally? <laughs> uh, okay. Oh boy, that's a tough one. All right, let me get a drink of water first. Let me think. Uh, scary, scary. Um, Hmm. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you one thing that sort of freaked me out. Um, I was uh, I was uh, going to a friend's wedding, and a buddy of mine. We were both ushers in the wedding, and we were driving to the uh, to the wedding, and it was pouring rain out, and uh, we were coming from Rochester, and we were going to. Uh, I think the wedding was in uh, Summers with the Rollinsford. And we were driving um, on Route 108, and all of a sudden, uh, we both kind of, out of the corners of our eyes, saw something off the road. And, and as, as we went by, my friend looked at me and said, did you see that? I said, yeah. I said, it looked like it was a car down an embankment. And he said, I said, yeah, I saw that too. He says, and I looked like someone was in it. I said, yeah. She said, should we turn around? We said, we might as well. There's nobody else around. You know, it's pouring out. So we, we 
did it, we, we made a safe U-turn, and we drove back, and we looked, and yeah, down the embankment into some trees was this car. So we got out, and you know, we're, we're all in tuxedos, and it's raining, and we, we kind of scampered down this embankment, and you know, worked our way over to the car, and we, we get to the car, and we look inside, and there's a clown in the car, and he's looking at us, and he's waving. <laughs> it was the last thing we expected to see. And, and he, uh, you know, he rolled down his window, and he said, he said, we said, are you okay? And he's like, yeah. He goes, I was on my way to a show, and I hydroplaned, and when I threw it, he goes, I made a call, and someone's coming to get me. And we said, okay. We said, just, you know, stop clowning around. And we, we climbed back up and got in the car. But there was just... It just it was freaky. It, it was nothing, nothing, something that was totally unexpected. <laughs> so, is that like inspirational for Snowball? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but I did. I did at one time. I, I did write a short story about that experience, but it uh, it, it was never published. Uh, I still have it, and maybe someday it'll see the light of day. It probably needs more work because I sent it out a few times and it got rejected a few several times. So, uh, but it, it did inspire me to write that story. So, so is there anything that actually like you? I'm a big chicken. <laughs> and so reading is one thing. If I had to write it, I mean, my mind, I'm sure, would go crazy. Do you get scared at all? Like, do you think about things at night and kind of go, ooh? Uh, um, uh, I try not to. But uh, sometimes if I'm, you know, I, I have a fairly big house with a lot of rooms, and sometimes I'll be in one room, and, and my wife will come around the corner without not expecting it and scare the crap out of me. Not trying to scare me, just the fact that she's suddenly there, and I didn't expect her to see her there. It's like, whoop. I'm like, whoa, where'd you come from? But uh, um, when I'm writing, I, I, don't, uh, I don't think I've ever written a scene that made me, that made me scared. I'm, I'm trying to write a scene, and I'm hoping it will scare somebody, but... I, I try not to scare myself. <laughs> yes? You have four boys as the main characters in the book. Yes. Um, who did you base them on and how did you make their, their characters? Um, they're not based on anybody because, you know, every book says that um, this is a work of fiction, no characters, places, and instance, a product of the, uh, you know, all product of the author's imagination. So, <laughs> no. Um, I don't, I don't, I know, I do not try to write about people I know. You know, I try to, I might get glimpses of characters from different people and mold it into a character, but I don't, like, I try not to base my characters on real people, because then real people will come after you and be mad. <laughs> why did you do that to me in your book? It's also why I try not, I try, it's very hard, I try not to use names of characters of names of people I know. Because at one time, my first book, I had a, a minor character, and b barely even in the book, and I had two people with that same name come up to me and say, why did you write that about me? You know, why did you make, make me the slutty chambermaid? I'm like, <laughs> It's not you. <laughs> so, uh, so I try not to uh, even use names of people I know. And it's very hard because I, I know a few people. So, but there will hopefully never be a Judy or Ellen or Gail. <laughs> yes? Was there a particular teacher or faculty member that was kind of your mentor or somebody that uh, you... Um, no, there is not. Mrs. Um, Kent would be very upset. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, I wrote I wrote a, a, a story in her class that was um, very um, a very violent horror story, and I got nothing but uh, red marks all over that said this is just an attempt to be gross and 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 <laughs> so not too happy with uh, that. Yeah, yeah. But uh, when I, I I did get my interest, uh, my, actually my start in being interested in writing when I was in sixth grade and I had a teacher who, uh, she gave us a class assignment, um, she gave, uh, she put us in groups of, of five and gave us an opening paragraph and said we would, have, each group was to collaborate and write a story based on that opening paragraph. So we all broke off into our groups of five and my group, we couldn't agree. You know, 
couple of people wanted to take it in this direction, a couple of people wanted to take it in that direction. So finally we went to the teacher and we said, can we split up? And she said, okay. So two people went off to write their story, two people went off to write theirs, and I went off by myself. <laughs> and I wrote a story and I won a blue ribbon for oh, wow. best story of the, of the class. <laughs> we had another class judge it and, and mine won. So, see, so I didn't want to collaborate with anybody. <laughs> Maybe if Stephen King wants to collaborate with someone, I'll consider it. But other than that, I'm on my own. Have you ever met Stephen King? Uh, yeah, I've, uh, m I've met him a few times, um, mostly years ago because he doesn't do a lot of public appearances anymore. Um, though I did, I did just hear that he was at the Wyndham Movie Theater uh, in Wyndham, Maine, uh, just recently. But uh, at Smitty's. yes, at Smitty's, yeah. yes. Um, he was at so. the Freiburg Fair. Yes, yes, I saw pictures of him at the Freiburg Fair. So you know, he pops up here and there. And um, was he there for his book, his newest no, book, I think or just as a just person as a, going? Just a regular, there. yeah, just as a regular Mainer. <laughs> But uh, uh, the first time I saw him, uh, he, very early in his career, he was at the Summersworth Public Library doing a talk, just like I am. Uh, he was a little more famous then, uh, not quite as famous. I think uh, I think it was around 1980, and um, I went to see him. And it was funny because his his brother was the tax collector in Summersworth for the city of Summersworth. And he gave up and gave the introduction to, to Stephen. Uh, and in his introduction, he was telling about the book Stephen had written. And he also said, and, and my brother's also written books under another name. And of course, everyone in the crowd was like, looking at each other, going, what, what? And then when Stephen King, uh, you know, he gave a reading and a talk. And then at the end, he asked for questions. And of course, the first question someone asked was, what other names have you written books under? And he said, oh, no, no, he said, my brother was, was mistaken about that. Of course, I immediately didn't believe him. And I, all those, for years and years, I said, I know he, he must have written books other than that. His brother wouldn't have just said that. And of course, it wasn't until like uh, maybe 20 years later that it came out that he had written several books under a different name. What would make somebody do that? Why would you do that? Um, his excuse at the time was, um, his publisher, he was, he, the other books he had written, they weren't quite horror, and his publisher said, you know, you, you're, you're kind of on this track as a horror writer, let, you know, you shouldn't publish this, uh, you know, so he just published it under a different name. Um, anyway, but it all came out, it always does. Uh, Michael Crichton used to write books under another name, and that all came out eventually, too. So, I'm not going to write books under any name <laughs> but mine. <laughs> I worked this hard. I'm not giving anyone else credit. So. Uh. I'm always interested on how um, writers stay disciplined, like what their routine is to keep mm. them on track, and especially when you're, you know, you're under contract and you're expecting it has to be done by you know, October. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 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 I was I was worried I was going to miss. You know, I I think I had to turn this in. I think it was in February, and I wasn't sure if that was too late for it to come out in October. But yeah. uh, I think they they made an effort to to get it out in in time for the month. Thank goodness, because it wouldn't have been as good coming out in November. I don't think. You have but, a, strict, um, a strict schedule for writing. Uh, it when I'm working on a on a on a book, I tr I try to uh, have a regiment and schedule. I don't, I don't give myself like a certain number of hours or a certain number of pages or anything or a certain number of words, but I just try to commit to spending a little time each day working on, on a book until, until it's done. Because it's, yeah, it's, it's involved. It it's, takes a lot of time. But uh, When you're writing a book, do you, do you normally kind of lay it all out? Uh, no. Uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of writers. There's two ways of uh, writers have two approaches, either the ones who outline and the ones who don't. I, I don't outline. Um, some, some do, they will outline before they even start writing, they'll outline the entire book, right. scene by scene, chapter by chapter, and then, and then write it. And that's a, you know, a way some writers like to prefer to it. Um, I, I don't. I just, I, I have, I, 
ideas about what's going to happen in the story, and I'll take a lot of notes. I fill notebooks with, you know, scenes or images or, or in the characters and stuff like that. And I, I have I, ideas of what's going to happen uh, here and there, but I don't know how it's all going to come together. Um, but then I just pick the point that I feel the story should start, and I let the story grow from there and just let things develop. It's kind of like, I always compare it to like walking into a labyrinth and you might take a few wrong turns and hit some dead ends, but then you kind of work your way through it and hopefully come out the other end <laughs> so most of the time. write a bit and then if you don't want to go that way, you just have to start yeah. over. It. When I was writing October, I originally had five boys and I was maybe uh, several, maybe four, chapters, four or five chapters into it, and I realized that it, something wasn't working with the, the two boys who were the two most main characters of the five, and I decided to combine them into one boy. So I had to, so I, I didn't, I didn't get rid of what I had written beforehand, I just continued with the story, but all of a sudden two boys became one. And then the story continued from there, and then after, once I get done, I don't do any editing until I get done the, the entire manuscript, then I go back, and then I had to go back and I had to fix the beginning because all of a sudden I had this extra character who didn't exist anymore. Do you have to send your publisher bits and pieces, like no. a lot of time just when it's totally when it's to They want it, yeah, they want a manuscript when it's totally finished and, and complete. And, so. and do you get to pick the um, cover? Um, they always ask for my advice they ask what I would like this the cover to look like and they say they say give you know give them four or five ideas of what I'd like the cover to look like or think it should look like and I'll I'll write jot down four or five ideas and and sometimes they just ignore everything I say or <laughs> they might come up with uh, yeah something like like uh, yeah I had several ideas and that was one of them so I mean you can't get more Halloweeny than a glowing jack-o-lantern so yeah, the scary pumpkin. So, but uh, when I uh, published my novel Snowball, I gave them several ideas, and they didn't use any of them. And they came up with this, which I loved, but it was not none of the concepts that I had given them. So, can you tell us more about the story? Uh, no. <laughs> 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 ah, I, um, yeah, it's uh, so basically this, you know, mysterious man arrives and uh, strange things start happening and these four boys notice it. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a boarding house with a bunch of elderly people live at and uh, the mysterious man who arrives uh, gets a room at, the, at this boarding house and there's another resident of the boarding house who is uh, an elderly man who uh, was a pulp horror writer back in the in the uh, 1920s and and uh, he has not left the boarding house in 40 years because of something he had seen and he has a connection to the man who arrived on the train. That's all you get. <laughs> and what's your description of like, everything when you're when you're trying to describe the town it's very detailed. Yeah. That's impressive. Right. <laughs> I, I wish I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I try. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's interesting. You're talking about boarding. I mean, they don't really exist today. You know, you have elder care systems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nursing. Home. That's one of the things that set in the story back in the in 1970 was because I wanted it to have a certain feel and things to be a little different than they are today. I didn't want cell phones, you know, because then you get the kids running around and they just, you know, <laughs> calling everyone on their cell phone or texting. Or, you know, I didn't want any of that. Um, so maybe I'll set all my stories in the 70s. <laughs> it was a wonderful time. <laughs> so, in fact, when I, I was, when I was writing this book, I had I had so much fun getting into it, and I was putting a lot of very nostalgic stuff in it, which is another reason I like Ray Bradbury, his dandelion wine, you know, all the nostalgia that that encompasses. So I wanted a lot of that in this book. Um, the unfortunate thing was when I got done the manuscript and I went, did several rewrites of it, 
it was too long for what my publisher accepts. And, um, and I knew what length they usually cap their books at, so I wrote to my editor and I said, I, I got good news and bad news. I got a new manuscript, but it's a little long. <laughs> I said, what, what will you, you know, what do I need, what do you need it to be at? And, because uh, it came out to 148,000 words. And he said, they capped theirs at 120,000. So he said, yeah, we have to really stick close to that 120,000. So I had to go and cut 28,000 words out of the story. So, so that's almost, almost a fifth of the book when you do the math. If, uh, Sharon, uh, when's that math lesson here? Because I, <laughs> I might need that. Uh, anyway, it's a lot of work. So it was a big chunk. So um, I knew, though, as I was writing, as it was getting longer, I kind of knew that this would be an issue. So I kind of had a backup plan in the back of my head. And so when it got to that point, I knew where I could start trimming it. I took out some of the fun, nostalgic stuff, you know. And um, there was one character, who, a uh, teenager, who's one of the uh, older brothers of the four boys. And he had some scenes by him, separate with him and his friends. And I just, I, I just had to eliminate some of that. I kept all the stuff that's the scary stuff. <laughs> I just get rid of some of the everyday life kind of stuff uh, that kind of fleshed out the, the, the people in the town. And um, so I kind of like to say I, I got rid of some of the fat without losing any of the flavor. So. You're already working on your next one, I think. Uh, I've already actually turned uh, my latest manuscript into my editor. And as I mentioned to someone here earlier, I, it's, it's, not, it's really not horror. It's got some horrific things in it, but it's not really horror. So I'm not sure if it's the right Right for my, uh, right for my publisher, but uh, I also have a couple other manuscripts that are done that I can, that uh, they can take a look at, and I probably will start a new book soon. So I already got an idea, and I'm already starting to take my notes, and uh, flesh out, figure out my characters, and I'll start writing that soon. Yes. Do you ever go back to U N H and talk or? Have uh, no, I have not. No, I don't even know if they know I exist. <laughs> None of my old professors are there anymore. <laughs> have you ever thought of doing just um, like a group of Stephen King? I think did this. I can't think of what the book was called, but short stories. So oh, yeah. like take some of these characters and things that you have developed or whatever, and just do yeah. some short stories into yeah. the book. Yeah, I have. Um, I have a. a Bunch of short stories I have written, and uh, yeah, I sometimes think uh, the problem with uh, short stories collections is that unless you're a name like Stephen King, they, they don't sell that well. So I don't know if my publisher. I, at some point, I will talk to my editor and say, "What do you think?" Um, but I don't know if you know it's something that they're willing to put the money into, knowing that it's you know it's not unless you're a big name writer, short story collections, uh, they're not a big marketing for that. So, but it's, it's always in the back burner. <laughs> is there a lot of symbolism in your work or is it pretty much what you see, what you get? Um, I, sometimes when I'm writing a book, I have maybe a certain theme in mind. Um, not necessarily something that I worry about the the reader picking up. It might be my own, like personal kind of theme going in, in, undercurrent in the in the story. Um, maybe some people might recognize it. Some people might not. Um, but uh, that has happened in some of my some of my books. Yes. And if you can figure out the theme, you win a prize. <laughs> So you walk around and you're just living life and then you see something <laughs> and it makes it, that'll make a great book. Or, uh, are they, those stories all just floating? Yeah, anything, anything I can see or experience or witness or, you know, sense, there's always a possibility that, oh, that could be, I could do something with that. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to give you a good example because it might be something I'm going to use. <laughs> 
but uh, yeah, I mean, any any anything can can trigger something. So. Mm -hmm. Last time you were here, we were talking about loonies. Yeah. And you had said that the finding the chest in the attic actually did happen. Yes. Yeah, so in Summersworth, if uh, some of you local people might remember, there was a famous case. I think it was in the nineteen early 80s, where uh, this family had been given a, a steamer trunk by the woman and said, can you hold on to this for me? And then 20-something years later, in the early 80s, they said, well, we still got this trunk lying around. Let's open it up. We don't, you know, we've been hanging on to this thing for like 25 years. They opened it up, and what they found inside was pretty horrific, and they, of course, they called the police, and there was a huge investigation. It became this huge story. Um, in fact, I think that trunk is actually at the Summersworth Historical Society. Um, uh, but and it was a case that was in the newspaper, and it got huge attention. And every so many years, there'd be like, oh, whatever happened with the, you know, because it never seemed to be a, a case that was resolved, because uh, the stuff that it involved with it was from the 1950s. So, um, you know, most of the people involved were long dead. And I was actually doing a book event in Dover for not, uh, I think it was for Loonies. And I was talking to some of the people at the event, and one of them was the former Summersworth police chief. And I said, oh, I said, I said, I, I, so I started telling him about how I was inspired to do that book based on that case. And I said, I always was fascinated about this, you know, unsolved case. And he told me, he goes, it's not unsolved. He goes, we know everybody that was involved and what happened. He said, it's just, everybody's dead, so there's nobody to go after. But, but if you Google Summersworth trunk case, you'll find stories about it, and it's fascinating. So I, it inspired me to write loonies. I just took the idea of this trunk found and open into the contents, and just created my uh, my own story. Yeah. So, that was a lot of that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Mm. Any other questions? Okay. And if you if if you think that it's too late in the year for a book called October, my novel Snowball is set at the Christmas season. <laughs> And it's set on Christmas Eve, so if you're if you're in for a different kind of holiday, you want you know, not a Hallmark movie kind of Christmas story, um, something a little darker, um, but that's that's a fun story set. Uh, it's about a bunch of uh, travelers on Christmas Eve who get snowbound on a turnpike during a blizzard, and they band together to try to. Uh, uh, survive, and then they realize there's something out in the storm that is much worse than the cold and the snow and the sleet and the wind. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and I have all my books available for purchase. Some of you have already purchased, but if anyone is interested, I have books to purchase. <laughs>